So let us start with the cecum. This is the cecum. This is the most dilated uh, or widest part of the large intestine. This is the first part of large intestine. It's a cecum. Uh, it's uh, a blind ended pouch. Look at it here. This is the cecum in which it opens up to the ascending column, but inferiorly, no, it's like a sac. So it's not open inferiorly so that's why it's a blind end pouch or sac first of all where is located which is important it's located in the right iliac fossa this is the right iliac fossa this is the iliac uh, uh, iliac bone and this is the right iliac fossa where is the cecum located and completely covered by peritoneum look at it here and um, although it's completely covered by peritoneum and it's uh, a kind of fixed by cecal folds as you see here but still it has a considerable amount of mobility um, uh, which is uh, uh, which is good so this is a caliber that you see here is the small intestine and these are superior mesenteric vessels and here's the right iliac fossa in which you see what we call it here is the cecum which is the cecum look at the hostra of large intestine look at the uh, omental appendices this is a transverse column anyway back to the cecum here in the right area uh, fossa let us open the let us remove the anterior wall of cecum let us open it and see what's in there first of all when you look to the cecum, what's most interestingly here, because we mentioned that this is the terminal part or the distant end of the ilium that opens into the posterior medial uh, wall of the cecum. That means this is what we call it ileocecal valve. This is the ileocecal valve, but this valve indeed let, let us look at it here it's look it looks like a two folds of a mucus uh, membrane um these um mucus membrane or we call it ileocecal folds you have one superior and one inferior so these folds united laterally to form frenulum we call the frenulum of ileocecal valve. This is the frenulum, right? And this is the superior and inferior mucosal fold or superior and inferior um, ileocecal uh, fold, right? So, do you think it's really a valve? Well, indeed, it's not. It's just two horizontal folds of mucous membrane projects around the orifice of ilium where is that this is the ileal orifice if you open them you will see here this opening is the ileal orifice this is the ileal orifice right so these are just mucosal folds around it anyway we call it ileocecal valve but indeed they don't have really sphincteric action to prevent the return of food or contents from the cecum and ascending colon um, uh, uh, into the ileum. So, uh, because during the endoscopy of a living person, they found that they really, really they don't have the uh, or this valve has no sphincteric action in uh, uh, closing and uh, preventing the return of contents into the ileum but indeed that's during the endoscopy in living person right but indeed look at the terminal end of the ileum and you know in its wall you have a smooth muscle that ends in this papilla you see this ileal papilla this ileal papilla indeed uh, which is under the uh, uh, well, that indeed the ileal papilla is the uh, structure that uh, located on the cecal side of course uh, that serves as a relatively passive flap valve that is preventing the uh, reflex from the cecum into the ileum as contraction um, occur to propyl content that means when the uh, stuff there in the cecum uh, try to push up this will lead to like uh, 
contraction of this papilla and preventing the return of the um, uh, content into the ileum. That means these folds is just a mucosal fold, and they found that the smooth muscle around the valve is like underdeveloped. That means there is no real anatomical valve. It just as the physiologists call it, ileocecal sphincter. Because, yes, it serves as a sphincter here. I mean the ileal papilla or the smooth or the circular muscle, sorry, uh, of the lower end of ileum. That means this is the ileum and the lower end of ileum, the circular muscle in the lower end of ileum, as physiologists, as the physiologists call it ileocecal sphincter, that serves as a sphincter and it controls the um, flow of contents from the ileum into the colon. So now how is contract and relaxed as physiologists said that the smooth muscle tune is reflexly uh, increased when the cecum is distended, right? When there is like stuff there, so then contracted uh, reflexly. So this smooth muscle reflexly increased uh, during the distension of the cecum. On the other hand, it's, you know, under the uh, what we call it a hormone called gastrin that's secreted, of course, produced by the um, stomach. This gastrin hormone indeed causes relaxation of muscle uh, tone. So by this way, it's contracted and relaxed. But the mucosal folds here has nothing to um, do uh, in the preventing of return of stuff from the cecum to the M. Anyway, so let us shift now to the uh, relation of the cecum. Relation of the cecum is very simple. You know that this is the cecum in which it's located again in the right iliac fossa. Excellent. So what's anteriorly? Of course, uh, you have the anterior abdominal wall. This is the cecum. So you have an anterior, the anterior abdominal wall. You have the greater omentum that you see here. We explain the greater omentum. We talked about it in the peritoneum lecture. And of course, you have a kind of coils of small um, intestine. That's anteriorly. But let us have a look to the upper figure here. And what's behind the cecum? Well, there are a couple of structures important behind the cecum you have two muscles three nerves two vessels excellent so because you know this is the iliac fossa that means this muscle is the iliacus muscle right and its sister there are two muscles right the iliacus and its sister we we call it psoas major muscle so psoas major muscle and iliacus these two sisters they united here to form iliopsoas muscle right so it's a very well-known symbol muscle that acts on the um, uh, bending uh, the trunk toward the um, thigh or and vice versa, of course, during the lama from your bed. Anyway, so you have the iliacus and you have the psoas major. And you know that there is a nerve passes along this or traverses the iliacus muscle. What's this nerve? It's the laterally cutaneous nerve of thigh. So this is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh that passes just on the iliacus. But there is another muscle passes on the psoas also, which is the genitofemoral nerve. Of course, this is a branch from the lumbar plexus. Anyway, so that means you have a nerve on the iliacus and you have a nerve on the genitofemoral nerve. Just extra information here that you know this nerve the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, this nerve passes in really tight, passes from uh, a tight location, which is between the anterior superior iliac spine and the inguinal ligament here. So this tight location, uh, especially those uh, carrying heavy uh, stuff on their flank and those wearing like tight uh, pelts, so this create a pressure on it leads to a numbness on the uh, anterior um, uh, uh, side of the uh, uh, thigh, right? So we explain that um, in a video, uh, in a separate uh, video, you can watch it as well. So anyway, just try to make sure that you remember. So this is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and this is the genitofemoral 
uh, nerve that passes through the inguinal canal on the way to the distance. Okay, especially the genital branch, I mean. The femoral branch, no. Outside to the upper right of the upper side of the uh, thigh. Okay, that means nerve on the iliacus, nerve on the south major, and there is a nerve between these two muscles, not just on them, no, between them, which is very known nerve. We call it femoral nerve. So you know that the femoral nerve passes between the two sisters, between iliacus muscle and psoas major muscle. Okay, so you have psoas, iliacus, you have lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, femoral nerve, genital femoral nerve, excellent. But also, you have two vessel, one large and one small. So you have the external iliac artery and you have the gonadal vessels, right? Conadal vessels. Okay, the right one, right? Because you have just one cecum, right? That's on the right. Excellent. Okay, so what about the blood supply of the cecum? Well, that's very simple. If you remember the superior mesenteric artery that gives a very important branch, which is the iliocolic artery that has colic branch and iliac branch that's why it's called iliocolic artery which is a branch of superior mesenteric artery okay now it has of course uh, it gives like let us say two branches the anterior cecal and posterior cecal arteries that uh, sub that they of course supply the um uh, cecum and the veins regarding veins uh, the same it drains into superior superior mesenteric uh, vein and lymphatic drainage as I always say the lymphatic drainage follow the deep arches so they will drain from different lymph several uh, mesenteric nodes finally to uh, reach the lymph nodes around the superior mesenteric artery we call it the superior mesenteric lymph node follow the arteries right so this is another view show you the superior mesenteric artery and the iliocolic artery that gives of course here is better to see the anterior cecal artery and the posterior cecal artery Let us start with the appendix. Um, you have an idea about the uh, cecum, of course, and you know from the cecum, or let us say the cecum, has two openings, one for the um, distal end of the ilium and uh, at the iliocecal junction uh, that opened, as I mentioned in the posterior medial wall that you cannot see here that's from the back now just about two centimeters uh, posterior to the opening of the ilium in the cecum there is another opening uh, which is um, for the appendix so yes this is the appendix which is also open in the posterior medial wall of the uh, cecum what's the appendix Indeed, the appendix is a narrow muscular tube uh, that has, uh, look at it here, it's connected uh, by a small triangular mesentery that we call it meso appendix, not mesocolon, not transverse mesocolon, not uh, uh, sigmoid mesocolon. It has a, a, a mesentery that specialized to it and its name, like preserved to it, it's meso appendix so this triangular small mesentery is the meso appendix look at the free border of this mesentery this is the free border of the meso appendix and if you look here you will see that there is an what we call it appendicular vessels passes at the free border of the meso appendix which is very important so this is the first thing that means the appendix is not just suspended by a mesentery called meso appendix and it's a free border there is an what we call it appendicular vessels pass to it but also it's completely covered by um, peritoneum 
and because uh, it's uh, you know it opens in the cecum that you expect that it's located in the right iliac uh, fossa so as i mentioned um um arises from posterior mirror aspect of the cecum just two centimeters below the ileocecal uh, uh, junction and you know it's about eight or seven to ten centimeters you know it's uh, variable from uh, from one to another and indeed histologically it contains a numerous lymphoid tissue in its um, uh, wall so uh, you know that it has uh, no tina coli and it has no omental appendices and also you know that in the large intestine the appendix and the rectum uh, have no tina coli right this is number one and also appendix cecum and uh, rectum we call it car, right? Cecum, appendix, and rectum, they don't have omental appendices. They don't have these peritoneal pouches that filled with fat, right? Okay, so yes, this is the appendix, and what's important uh, about the uh, location of the appendix, I would like to say, let me erase it, uh, that during surgery sometime i will show you where is really the uh, different position of the appendix appendix has a couple of positions but sometime it's hidden behind the cecum and ascending column or behind the ileum so surgeons usually follow the tina coli of the ascending colon and cecum all the way until it ends when the tina coli ends we know that it is now here is the pace of the appendix that means as i mentioned earlier at the beginning of the video that the tina coli ends at the pace of the appendix that means they the surgeons follow the tina coli until very until it ends once it ends they know yes we found the pace of the appendix so where is the pace of the appendix why we care about the pace of the appendix but not the um apex of the appendix itself because the apex of the the apex of the appendix can be variable can be like behind the cecum behind the ascending colon um hang down in the pelvis or behind the idiom or anterior to idiom or whatever so there are a couple of positions we'll talk about them but but the pace of the appendix is the fixed part that we are care about so you remember uh, from previous lectures that this is the iliac bone and anteriorly there is a process very important a process we talk too much about it which is the anterior superior iliac spine anterior superior iliac spine very important easy landmark to find and you know the umbilicus here so if you draw a line between these two landmarks and if you take the point that's located one third of the way um, along the oblique line uh, that joining anterior superior spine and umbilicus you will find the location of the ampel uh, the pace of appendix that means this is the oblique line divided into three parts okay so this is the medial third this is the middle third and let us say this is the medial if it's correct to say the medial Two third, and this is the lateral one third. So the point of meeting between the lateral one third and the medial two third here is the McBurney point. This is very important to know in the exams and in the surgeries and in the clinical. Why? Why is clinical is important because surgeons open incision there at this location and also it is the location of the pace of the appendix that means if during the uh, rebound test or during the uh, let us say the physical examination of the appendix if you suggest uh, or you suspect you have um, a patient uh, with uh, uh, appendicitis so 
you go to this McPirney point and create a kind of uh, a little bit of pressure or something called rebound test you make a pressure then you removed your hand suddenly then because the brittle peritoneum here is irritated that means create a severe pain in the right iliac fossa so this is the point of the maximum pain during the appendicitis I mean the inflammation of the appendix. So this point is the McBurney point, which is um, that indicates the base of the appendix. Again and again, I'm saying base, not the apex. Okay. So let us um, have a look about or an idea about the most common positions of the appendix, and um, you know maybe that. The most common one, which is the retrocecal, or we call it sometimes retrocolic. So this is the deadline showed that the um, appendix or the um, apex of the appendix behind the cecum, we call it retrocecal or retrocolic because it's behind the cecum and or behind the ascending column. This one, which is common, about 65% is really common here. Retro, sigal, or retro, colic. And the second most common position is the pelvic. We call it a pelvic appendix. It just um, hangs down into the uh, pelvis. It's about, let us say, 30% um, or 32%, this one, right? This is the pelvic. So you have to know that the First, to I mean the retrocecal or retrocolic and the pelvic um, appendix. Um, these are the most common position or most common sides of the appendix. So if you don't find the appendix, he is most commonly behind the cecum. It's hidden behind the cecum. So you have retrocecal, retrocolic, or sometimes just hang down into the pelvis. Uh, other position was like rare can be subsecal, um, that means below the cecum, and it's about two percent here. Here you can see the percent, right? Sometimes it's um, behind the ilium. Uh, we call it post ilial, and like this like this one, or anterior to ilium, we call it pre-ilial. So it can be pre-ilial or post-ilial, but just uh, low percentage. Yes, so you have to know where is the most common position, which is important. So you see in this figure, my friends, that uh, somebody with acute appendicitis that like look to the appendix, which is uh, uh, really inflamed, and in this case, in the I mean the acute appendicitis, it's a common inflammation of the appendix, uh, caused sometimes by bacteria, sometimes because of obstruction of the lumen um, of the appendix for a reason or another. Can be sometimes obstructed by feces during if somebody has a constipation or so. Sometimes inflamed and the lumen closed and so forth. In this case, the inflamed. The inflamed um, appendix can uh, sometimes uh, obstruct the blood supply, and also the inflammation can obstruct the blood supply, can lead to gangrenous, gangrenous appendicitis, right? Which is really um, a severe um, danger case, right? So, first of all. Uh, we mentioned it can be inflamed, swelling, and the lumen obstructed. So, when the lumen obstructed, that means the secretion of the appendix can be uh, uh, like restricted inside it. That means swelling more and more, and you know it's covered by visceral peritoneum. That means the visceral peritoneum will be like stretched and will be like severe pain. And you know maybe that the Appendix, look at it here. So the uh, uh, appendix, which is located here, right, uh, it is innervated. The sympathetic fibers that um, uh, sympathetic fibers that innervate the appendix also innervate the umbilicus, and because the pain from appendix um, ascends into the same 
spinal cord segments, or let us say the thin thoracic segments, segments. So the pain at first from the appendix felt around the umbilicus. That's why we feel some, you know, or those come up with acute appendicitis they feel at the first the pain felt around the umbilicus then it shifted to the right iliac fossa why because as i mentioned the you know this area indeed innervated um uh, or uh, yes innervated by uh, number nine chin 11 uh, uh sympathetic fibers i mean from a spinal uh, segments number nine chin and eleven and the pain from that area ascends in these spinal segments and number ten also extends to the appendix right and that's why the visceral once it's inflamed swelling the visceral peritoneum stretch you get pain in the visceral peritoneum then uh, it carried the pain carried by thoracic um, uh, segment uh, by a nerve to the thoracic segment in the spinal cord number 10 and it also the uh, 10th thoracic segment receives also sensation from umbilicus so then the body cannot discriminate the pain that it comes from the appendix or from the uh, umbilicus so you feel the pain around the umbilicus then once the visceral peritoneum inflamed it irritates the parietal peritoneum above it here which is that lines the anterior abdominal wall that means the parietal peritoneum that lines the abdominal wall also irritated and there is a pain there so when you do a rebound test or you make like a little bit of pressure on the right iliac fossa you guilt the pain there that means the pain shifted from umbilicus to the right iliac fossa because the parietal peritoneum above it now it's irritated and the pain can be felt at the right iliac uh, fossa okay so we mentioned that this is the meso appendix um, with the mesentery of the appendix and in its free border you have a blood vessel a particular artery which is a branch of if you follow it here to the pack okay so this is the appendicular uh, artery right which is a branch of iliocolic artery this one right and it is a branch of superior mesenteric artery that means you expect the venous drainage also back to the superior mesenteric vein ilio of course iliocolic vein and superior mesenteric uh, vein and also the lymphatic drainage similar to the cecum to the lymph nodes around the superior mesenteric artery we call them superior mesenteric lymph uh, Nodes. So lastly, uh, as we talked about the uh, appendix connected to the cecum and mesoappendix, it's good to show you these um, folds. Look at these folds. You have around three folds fixing the cecum. So um, all of them except one, they have blood vessels uh, in um, those folds. So look at it here laterally. You have the cecal folds. We call them cecal folds. Also here, medially, you have this fold. We call it vascular fold of cecum. So this is the vascular fold of cecum that contains the anterior, the and the that contains the anterior cecal artery. You know the cecum supplied by anterior cecal artery and posterior cecal artery. So this vascular fold we call it vascular fold of cecum why vascular fold because there is a bloodless fold that means a fold here which is between the ilium and cecum we call it ilio cecal fold or we call it bloodless fold of trifs which is this fold mostly doesn't has blood vessels but listen, sometimes it does. Sometimes, um, uh, uh, often it has. Yes, 
you can find the blood vessels uh, blood vessels in it so yes these are all these folds i would like i would like to pay attention cecal folds here vascular fold that contains the um uh, the uh, let us say the uh, anterior cecal artery and you have bloodless fold which is uh, we call it ilio cecal fold that has no blood vessels mainly uh, so and lastly you have one recess below the uh, the vascular fold and one recess below this bloodless fold of treves right this is the superior and this is the inferior ilio cecal uh, recess this is a recess right okay 